Well, hello, everybody. Um, just a couple of reminders before we get started today. Uh, please register and log your attendance using the URL or QR code shown at the top right hand corner of this slide. This is going to help us keep track of attendance, particularly for those participating in our CNB testing. Uh, we are recording these webinars and posting them along with uh, the slides at our website. Um, since we do have a large number of participants on the calls, attendees are going to be muted upon entry. So this means that if you do have questions, we ask you to please use the Q&A box, which should be located at the bottom or right side of your screens. Um, just a reminder that you must be signed into the webinar to submit questions live. Erin Riggs is going to be manning the Q&A today, so thanks to Erin. And if you are not logged in using your full name, please add it along with your question so that we can credit you and send you an answer directly if we don't have time to get to it on the call today. Um, at the end of the series, uh, we are going to be having a Q&A session. So if we don't have time to get to particular questions, we will try to address them uh, in a later meeting. And then finally, uh, you can also email us at clingen at clinicalgenome.org with any uh, questions or comments about these webinars. So welcome to everybody on the call. My name is Erica Anderson. I'm a Cytogenetics Medical Director and Assistant Professor at ARUP Laboratories in the University of Utah. I am also co-chair of the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Curation Working Group and a member of the CNB uh, Technical Standards Committee. And I'm happy to be here to provide an overview for you all today on the use of the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Map. So among the various ongoing gene and variant curation activities in ClinGen, we in the Dosage Sensitivity Curation Working Group work to address this basic question. Does the loss or gain of a copy of a particular gene or genomic region result in a clinical phenotype? And here we're focusing on constitutional disorders. Our curation process was originally outlined in a publication by Aaron Riggs et al. back in 2011. And this was an effort of the ISBN, or International Standards for Cytogenomic Array Consortium, to provide a more consistent and rigorous process for curating information relating to copy number variants. Over time, both our organization and our curation processes have evolved, including the formation of focus subgroups aimed at dosage curation for genes associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, genomic regions, including recurrent CNVs, and genes associated with hereditary cancers. Still, as this outline shows, our core processes for evidence-based review really remain the same. First, we collect evidence linking the deletion or duplication of individual genes or regions to a clinical phenotype. Uh, the primary source of this information is the peer-reviewed literature, including case reports and case series, which tend to have more detailed phenotypic information, inheritance data, and for some variants, functional studies. Uh, but we also incorporate information from clinical and control databases in these reviews. Second, we evaluate and summarize this evidence, including the total number of unrelated individuals reported across multiple independent studies, the specificity and consistency of phenotypes observed amongst patients, whether reported variants are de novo inherited, penetrance, and for certain variants, the molecular mechanism of pathogenicity. We then assign two rating scores, a haploinsufficiency or HI score, and a triple sensitivity or TS score for each gene and region evaluated. And then following this review process, we present our curations for committee review. And with, groups, with group consensus, we close these reviews out to publish them on our public website. So this slide illustrates the types of variants that we typically encounter during haploinsufficiency evaluation. If tasked to evaluate the potential haploinsufficiency of gene B, our primary goal is to identify whole gene deletions that are isolated or focal to that particular gene. However, as breakpoints of these events are often variable, we may encounter deletions that partially overlap our gene of interest or include additional genes. 
Partial gene deletions, as well as sequence variants that result in nonsense mediated decay, may also be counted towards the haplo insufficiency score, particularly when these are shown to result in the same phenotype of patients with whole gene deletions. But because the potential contribution of adjacent genes uh, and non-focal deletions are typically not utilized in haploinsufficiency scoring, um, these are typically documented, documented only as supportive or secondary evidence. So in these cases, um, particularly if these non-focal deletions reoccur, we may end up creating a region in order to document, document evidence linking such events to clinical phenotypes. And then at the bottom of this slide are a few additional scenarios that we may encounter. Um, we sometimes find reports of gene disruptions through balanced rearrangements, such as translocations. Uh, typically, these types of events are not counted towards the haploinsufficiency score since the functional impact and potential contribution of the reciprocal breakpoint may be unknown. Um, and then finally, we do provide scoring for genes associated with autosomal recessive phenotypes through biallelic disruptions affecting both copies of a gene. So here, gene C would be given, given an autosomal recessive risk classification under the haploinsufficiency score. For triplet sensitivity evaluation, we're a bit more restrictive in, in terms of the types of variants we include as supportive evidence for dosage sensitivity. Here, only copy number gains that are isolated to gene B and that would result in a whole gene duplication can be counted. Uh, duplications that are focal but overlapping gene B may actually disrupt this gene, and so um, these are actually more appropriate to document in the haploinsufficiency review if warranted. Non-focal duplications that result in three copies of gene B but involve additional genes are typically not utilized for triplosensitivity scoring of individual genes, though they will typically be documented, again, as supportive evidence. And then here, uh, again, if these events are recurrent, we may end up creating a region in order to document evidence linking such events to clinical phenotypes. Um, and then finally at the bottom, although rare recurrent gains that result in tetrasomy or triplication, such as the isodicentric proximal 22Q region uh, that um, result in cat eye syndrome may also be curated by our group. So in the dosage sensitivity curation group, uh, we use a numerical score to rate strengths of evidence associated with dosage sensitivity. A three score is the highest level of evidence linking a gene or region to a clinical phenotype through deletion or duplication. And this corresponds to sufficient evidence for dosage sensitivity. A two score indicates that there is some evidence for dosage sensitivity to be emerging. One indicates that there's little evidence or uh, information is limited. And then a zero indicates that either no evidence exists or in some cases that the evidence is currently insufficient. The dosage sensitivity on likely category indicates genes and regions for which there is evidence refuting dosage sensitivity. And then finally, uh, we do have a ranking that's applied to recessive disease genes. So as I mentioned, our curation processes are evolving, particularly with the development of scoring metrics for clinical interpretation. Um, this layout for our new single genes metrics should look familiar as it's based on section four of the clinical interpretation metrics. Um, and we began applying these processes to our new evaluation of genes starting actually about a year ago in February of 2019. We're also drafting a new scoring metric for recurrent CNVs, which are typically non-focal or multigenic deletions and duplications, many of which were originally discovered through the use of genomic microarray analysis in a genotype first type of approach. These CNVs are particularly challenging to classify along traditional dosage scoring and clinical classification scales due to reduced penetrance, phenotypic variability and frequency of detection across different populations and testing platforms. Um, our metric for recurrent CNVs is still in draft form as I'm showing you here, but it is being developed alongside updated curations for many of these difficult regions. And uh, we do hope to finalize this metric alongside updating region reviews in the coming months. So stay tuned for that. 
So as Erin mentioned last week, our dosage sensitivity map website, which has historically been hosted by NCBI, will be transferred over to ClinGen soon. Um, actually, I believe that's starting today. So don't be surprised if you're redirected the next time you visit. However, the website is going to look exactly the same for a while. Um, alongside this transfer, we do have a number of updates coming to the site content itself. So um, again, stay tuned for these coming changes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's take a look at how to find information from our main page. So in this top section here, um, searches can be performed by inputting a gene name on the left or by the genomic location on the right, I, either uh, by inputting the genomic coordinates or by inputting cited genetic band location. Below this on our main page, we provide information on genes and regions that have been recently reviewed for the first time, as shown at the top here. Uh, as well as those whose scores have changed and are now updated since the original review. Um, and you can see that we haven't updated any scores in the past 13 weeks. We also provide curation statistics for our users so that they can see how many genes are completed out and where we are in our review processes. So currently, we've completed reviews of close to 1,500 genes and regions. Uh, these pie charts show the breakdown of haploid sufficiency and triplosensitivity scores that have been made so far. So looking at haploid sufficiency, you can see that we have a large number of genes with autosomal recessive disease risk association that have been closed out. And of the remaining reviews, most of these have either sufficient or no evidence supporting dosage sensitivity. Uh, though we do have a good number with little or some evidence that they may be dosage sensitive. For triple sensitivity, we have fewer genes and regions with the one to three scores. Most genes either have no evidence, or for some of our autosomal recessive genes, the corresponding triple sensitivity score has not yet been evaluated. So far, few genes and regions have actually been curated as dosage sensitivity unlikely. And we plan to utilize resources, resources uh, such as the DGV and NOMAD, um, which you're going to hear about more in February, to help us expand this set of reviews in the future, um, particularly as uh, it'll be important to have these types of regions annotated for clinical EMV interpretation. So next, we'll show you how to perform a gene search using the dose sensitivity map. And I've chosen the gene shank 3 to take you through. So as you start to type, the site will actually search for other reviews with the same name and make suggestions for you. You can just choose shank 3 and then click the Go button to navigate to the curation page for this gene. So for, from here, you can see that the curation of this gene is complete. Uh, that it was last evaluated in 2018, and that the haploid sufficiency score is a three, the triplo sensitivity score is a zero. Uh, we also provide links out to other resources, including the gene page, OMAM, gene reviews, if there's a, a, a link to gene reviews, and uh, the predecessor to NOMAD, exact probability of loss of function intolerance, or PLI score, um, which is another area that we plan to update uh, in the coming months. On the right side, you can see where the gene localizes to on chromosome 22, and um, you can also link out to the genomic region through your favorite genome browser. At the bottom of this page are tabs to review evidence for haploid sufficiency and triplo sensitivity. So here you can see a summary of the information that links shank 3 deletion to feline McDermott syndrome with sufficient evidence. Um, and because historically three patient reports were considered sufficient evidence for dosage sensitivity, the current layout of these pages is going to show you three references, um, up to three references with links out to PubMed in this top section. Below this is a free text comment field that may include additional curated literature summaries as well as a summary comment, which is highlighted by the green box here. Um, though some three-score gene reviews may be less detailed, we are aiming to provide a summary comment in all our reviews to briefly describe the gene, its mutational spectrum, uh, the associated phenotype, any genotype-phenotype associations, and to document reduced penetrance if it has been demonstrated. 
moving over to the triple sensitivity evidence tab, uh, you can see that even though this gene is scored with no evidence, uh, there may still be additional information documented in the comment section. So here we state that scoring is based on a lack of reports of focal duplications in the literature. Uh, but below this, we do describe patients with non-focal duplications. And though SHANK3 is thought to contribute to the core features of Kalin McDermott syndrome caused by deletion, um, should a critical duplication region be delineated in the future, we could create a region review as we've done for other terminal chromosome regions such as 1P, 4P, um, and 5P, and then move these reviews over to a region review. So let's next perform a search on the CNV listed at the top of this slide. This CNV is described according to the 2016 version of the International System of Human Cytogenomic Nomenclature, or ISCN. Um, it's described as an array identified deletion within 22Q13.33, which is about one megabase in size. Um, in order to search this region in a dosage map, we're going to need to convert the CNV into the format shown in the example below the input field. Commas are optional, you don't have to put them in, um, but the reference genome build needs to be 37, uh, which is the case for our variant. Um, and then if you have your variant in a different, um, according to a different reference genome build, uh, tools such as those provided in the UCSC genome browser can be performed, uh, can be used to perform a, a liftover to convert coordinates if needed. So once you input your coordinates correctly, you can click the go button. Performing the search will return a list of genes and any annotated regions that overlap the region of interest. Here you can see that 44 genes reside within the deleted interval of this patient. Um, and then from this tab, you can sort by the haploid sufficiency score to identify which genes in the regions have been scored. So you can see that seven genes in this region have been curated, one of which is curated as haploinsufficient. The rest are classified as conferring autosomal recessive disease risk. Um, so for clinical review, alongside review of evidence relating to the region deletion, the dosage map can be used to classify CNVs containing known haploinsufficient genes and highlight any potential important genes in the region, both dominant and recessive acting. So in addition to performing searches on our website, users can visit our file transfer, transfer protocol or FTP page, which Aaron showed you all last time. Uh, here you can download several files containing lists of curated genes and regions, which have been formatted for use in genome browsers, as well as uh, visualization software. Uh, many of these files are updated on a regular basis. Um, so it's good to always check back and make sure that these files are current. So uh, for example, here you're viewing the same 22Q deleted region in the UCSC genome browser. Um, once downloaded, users can actually upload these custom tracks using the add custom tracks feature in UCSC. Um, in the green box, you can see that the seven genes that we identified from our search um, are listed here. They're shown here uh, that they've been curated in the haploinsufficiency scored file. Additionally, you can turn on the ClinGen CNVs track, which is shown in the purple box here. Um, and Erin also went over this last time. This shows that of these genes that have been curated, only Shank3 in red has been curated as a known haploinsufficiency gene. Another useful track that I wanted to highlight is our recurrent CNV regions file, which was developed by members of our recurrent CNV curation team and released in October of 2018. So this track is shown with the green box. Um, it will display both regions containing segmental duplications in black, as well as the unique intervening sequence in orange. The coordinates for these regions were determined by using the innermost unique coordinates flanked by these segdupe regions. Um, and we also have a standardized approach to region naming, which we will be adding uh, to the website soon. So if you want to read more about these tracks and how they were developed, um, uh, please keep a lookout for that. 
this track is um, helpful to identify recurrent CNV regions, some of which are known to be disease causing. Um, here I'm showing you the 17P12 deletion and duplication, which cause autosomal dominant HMPP and Charcot Marie Tooth type 1A syndromes, respectively. These pathogenic CNVs are shown in the purple box, um, which is annotated in the ClinGen CNVs curated track, um, along with the, the critical gene in the region, which is PMP22. If we want to come back over to the curation page for this gene, you can see again that although PMP22 is thought to contribute to features of CMT1A, because focal gene duplications have not been recorded, the score for the, the gene itself is currently at zero. But at the bottom, we provide a link over to the related region from the gene page so that users are aware that they can also review evidence from the region curation. Uh, and then finally, we invite users of the dosage sensitivity map to send us feedback and any questions that they may have about the use of our website or um, about individual genes themselves. As we saw last time, users can submit information to us on specific genes and regions directly from their pages. That's going to be shown on the left-hand side there. Um, so you can report information to us. Um, or you can submit more general queries and requests using the form from our main page. So next I'm going to be moving on to the use of the dosage sensitivity map for clinical CNV review, uh, but I wanted to first acknowledge the many wonderful members of our curation team, both past and present, um, in particular, Kristen Martin, Eric Thorland, Aaron Riggs, John Harrigan, and Mackenzie Goodenberger, who are helping us continue to push forward in our various curation efforts on this team. So thanks to you all for all the hard work that you do. So uh, moving on, as I hope we've illustrated already, alongside evolving curation processes, the updated technical standards for CNV interpretation and reporting have evolved as well. Uh, using the original 2011 guideline as our foundation, the new technical standards uh, incorporated ranking methods and processes that are utilized for the analogous review of sequence variants in order to build more detailed and quantitative scoring me methods for CNVs. Um, but how do we incorporate the dosage sensitivity map evidence into this new mode of copy number variant evaluation? So in section two of the metric, following evaluation of a CNV for gene content, users are prompted to evaluate whether their CNV completely overlaps an established doses sensitivity gene or region. Um, these are defined in the supplement as those with sufficient evidence for haploid sufficiency or triplet sensitivity, or basically those that have a dosage sensitivity three score. Um, and then sim similar to gene dosage evaluation, CNV evaluation involves a review of overlap to curated dosage sensitive regions. So for losses, any region that completely overlaps a known haploinsufficiency gene, such as gene 3 in this example, is considered to be pathogenic and awarded one point. Um, here, similar to the HNPP CMT1A region, a region encompassing this gene is also uh, annotated. So the top two deletions would qualify as pathogenic even if the haploinsufficiency genes weren't established within it. Um, but the deletion uh, under if the deletion under evaluation is not fully contained by the established region or doesn't overlap a known HI gene, then users should not add or subtract points but continue their evaluation. For gains, the process is also similar. This example illustrates a curated triplo-sensitive region for which a causative gene is not known. The top two duplications completely overlap this region and are thus considered pathogenic, whereas the bottom two only partially overlap and must be further evaluated using evidence specific to these dosage, uh, to these duplicated regions. And then if the CNV partially overlaps a curated haploinsufficiency or triplet sensitivity gene, additional evaluation to determine the, the potential functional impact 
uh, is required. So this is based on breakpoint location, involvement of coding sequence for partial gene deletions and duplications, and evidence from the literature. And uh, Danny Pineda Alvarez will have more information regarding these types of CMBs in his webinar on February 6th. So conversely, during the evaluation, one may also come across a CNB overlapping in established benign regions. Um, as outlined in the supplement in general, uh, these are CNBs that occur at a high frequency in the general population that are not known to be more frequent in cases compared to controls and are also not associated with any consistent phenotype. For losses, any deletion that completely overlaps or is contained entirely within an established benign region is considered to be benign. Uh, those that include additional genomic material must be further evaluated. So the evaluation of duplications involving established benign regions is a bit more nuanced. Uh, here again, a duplication completely overlapping and identical to such a region is considered benign, uh, but for duplications that are contained within such regions, one must evaluate whether a smaller duplication intersects a gene within this region, as these types of duplications could potentially disrupt gene expression. Uh, for those extending beyond the defined benign region, one must continue the evaluation if additional genomic material is involved, and if not, depending on the extent of the duplication, it may actually be appropriate to continue your evaluation. So just a couple of notes on uh, utilizing the dosage sensitivity map scores. In general, if a CNV reaches a one or negative one score due to complete overlap with an established dosage sensitive gene or region, users of these metrics may not need to proceed further. Um, however, for some CNVs, particularly those with incomplete penetrance or variable expressivity, additional evaluation may be necessary. And uh, a cost Caution is recommended before interpreting a CNB based on this information alone. When reviewing ClinGen dosage sensitivity scores, it's important to note the date of last evaluation, as curations may reflect a temporary uh, static assessment. Uh, new evidence may have emerged since the date of a last evaluation, either supporting or refuting the original assessment. Um, so before moving on to our example case, here's a reminder for anyone who is late to join us today, please log your attendance. And I would also like to acknowledge our working group for the CNV interpretation guidelines, including those who helped us vet the metrics during their development um, and also develop uh, tools for their utilization, including the CNV calculator. So in the last part of this talk, I'm gonna take you through a clinical evaluation process, combining the use of the metrics and the dosage sensitivity map. Um, case B is an array identified deletion with an XT22.11, which is about 440 KB in size. This deletion was identified in a three-year-old female who was referred for genomic microarray testing due to the following findings, postnatal growth deficiency, a ventricular septal defect, scoliosis, hand anomalies, hearing loss, and craniofacial dysmorphism. A parental testing was performed and showed that this deletion was maternally inherited. So first, let's take a look at the region in the UCSC genome browser alongside some of our tracks. Um, at the top are the rest curated genes, uh, only one of which, PTCHD1, is protein coding. Uh, you can see that this gene has been annotated as disease-causing in OMIM and also as dosage sensitive by ClinGen. Uh, we can also see by looking at the DGB track that this region does not represent common variation. Um, and while there are CNVs that are contained within this interval, they do not intersect uh, with coding material.
Now going over to the dosage sensitivity map uh, score for this region, uh, we can see that there are three genes displayed. We have a, um, a, a non-protein coding gene, uh, a protein coding gene, and then a predicted gene, which is why this gene, uh, LOC with a lot of numbers after it, uh, was not shown in the RefSeq curated track in UCSD. So if we click on the link on the right-hand side here, we can go over to the gene record for this gene. And here we can see um, that the curation status is complete for this gene. It was evaluated also in 2018. Um, and since we're focused on deletions, we're going to take a look at the haploinsufficiency score, which for this particular gene is a three. Scrolling down to the bottom of the page, you can see that this gene is associated with an X-linked um, autism susceptibility phenotype. Uh, and we do provide links out to OMIM so that you can read more about the phenotypic information associated with these types of genes. Okay, and in OMIM, what we learn is this is that this is an excellent recessive phenotype. Um, it's a, it's a recessive phenotype, so we expect that this will be evident in males um, and not necessarily females, but we should um, do a little bit of research to learn more about the expressivity in females. Um, below this are the clinical findings. You can see that um, many of the clinical findings that we see associated with this gene are considered to be neurologic. Um, and in comparison to our patient, um, many of the clinical features that were listed um, are not really seen um, as associated with uh, deletion of this gene. So coming back to the um, evidence curation for this gene, uh, I wanted to point out uh, what, how ClinGen rates genes and regions on the X chromosome. So at the bottom, you can see um, a little bit of information about uh, X genes and uh, regions. So these ratings are typically made in the context of a male genome, um, although for some genes and regions, due to either observed or presumed lethality in males, we may instead score according to the phenotype in females. Um, so in this case, we have a female who's a carrier of an X-linked recessive deletion. What does this mean for our patient and how should we classify it? Um, so let's first take a look at this first cited paper. So this is a, a study by Chaudhry et al. They reported 23 individuals from 16 families uh, who carried either truncating mutations or deletions involving the PTCHD1 gene. Uh, they reported that PTCHD1 disruptions in males are associated with neurodevelopmental disorders of varying severity, um, including autism spectrum disorders and other behavioral characteristics, which we also saw summarized in OMIM. Uh, in this study, they state that we did not have detailed information on female carriers, um, including mothers, sisters, grandmothers of the probands, uh, but they were reported to have no major problems um, in terms of uh, intellectual disability and neurodevelopmental um, phenotypes. So um, it's, it's presuming that female carriers are unaffected. Um, more studies, they state that more studies are needed uh, in females to clarify whether carrier status and act in activation patterns may have more subtle effects on the phenotype. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to show here was that our patient's deletion overlaps um, a lot of the deletions that were reported here, and that's highlighted in pink. Looking at some additional details in terms of the patients that were reported in this study, they did have a single female subject, uh, subject K1, who had a history of speech delay um, and did have a subsequent diagnosis of high-functioning autism spectrum disorder. 
Um, her unaffected mother also carried the deletion and they did perform X inactivation studies, but these were uninformative. Um, and so the authors state that they can't rule out a subtle neurodevelopmental phenotype in carrier females and suggest that more in-depth studies are needed. So across the, all the studies that were curated as uh, in the dosage scoring for this particular region, um, I won't have time to go through all of the literature, um, but this is the only report of uh, an affected female uh, that has been, um, a potentially affected female that has been reported in association with this deletion. So coming back to the classification for our patients, um, this, this variant would be classified as pathogenic, and this is based on our dosage evaluation. Uh, as noted at the top here, classification of losses involving X-linked recessive genes in females should not be based on the predict, or should be based on, excuse me, uh, the predicted impact in a male. So this should not change depending on whether um, the variant is observed in a female or male. Using the loss metric, uh, if you were to take this through, users would essentially stop at the step 2A. But if we haven't, hadn't scored this gene, the CNV could still be evaluated with use of the metric. And so below this, I modified the use for an X-linked recessive inheritance pattern, uh, given that we expect females to be unaffected carriers. So, as I mentioned, in addition to the Chaudhry et al. study, additional reports with consistent findings are available in the literature. Um, and using supportive evidence, such as the frequency of loss of function variants in cases versus controls, although uh, data are generally a little bit more limited um, on the X chromosome, uh, we could easily arrive at a similar classification. And in terms of how to work through X-linked uh, X-linked genes using these metrics, more details on curation of X-linked genes are um, are being developed by the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Group, and um, these are coming soon. So stay tuned for that. So what do we do with this variant, which does not really explain the clinical phenotypes of our patient? Um, so we recommend that given the significant reproductive risk to female carriers of X-linked conditions, uh, that uh, reporting of these variants is warranted because it provides the opportunity for the patient and relevant family members to pursue additional testing and counseling as needed. Uh, additionally, as seen in the one case that um, was reported in the literature, females may manifest symptoms in many X-linked disorders. And it's, um, it can be difficult to predict whether uh, a female is going to be more mildly affected or potentially affected similarly to a male. So um, these the variants may ultimately still have um, an impact on a patient's medical management, particularly if they're identified um, early on um, and there may be later onset of some of the symptoms. Um, so generally what we recommend is you would report this and in my last slide I have an example report this is one of the questions that was submitted on our last webinar was uh, do we have some guidance on how to report um, this example report is number six that's provided in the supplemental material um, from the Riggs et al paper and you can find it there. Here's an example of an X-linked finding in a female. This patient was a nine-year-old female referred for hearing loss, and um, the test did identify uh, a pathogenic deletion similar to our, our patient here. In this case, it was involving the gene ATP7A. Um, so in this example report, it's recommended to include the classification. It is pathogenic, but then you will also include uh, a relevance category that will, uh, that will indicate that this confers carrier status for this deletion. Uh, importantly, um, in, this is just some example language that users could um, refer to. 
Um, we do mention that X inactivation could uh, result in clinical findings um, and that genetic counseling and clinical correlation are recommended to discuss the potential reproductive implications of this finding and also to determine if additional testing is warranted um, to identify the genetic etiology for this patient's uh, clinical findings. And so for our patient, we wouldn't we wouldn't want uh, the testing to stop here. We would want to describe that they, this does confer carrier status, but additional genetic testing would be warranted. And with that, I think I will open this up for questions. Um, and Aaron is, uh, is fielding questions on the Q&A. So Aaron, if you want to um, let me know what the questions are, I can also take a look. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a good question um, coming in through the Q&A. Someone was asking about for our recurrent regions um, or even any of our region issues. Can you talk a little bit about um, how we come up with what the coordinates are going to be for those regions and um, where we mention if we know anything about what the um, critical regions are? Yes. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will be providing more details to users who want to download uh, that track about where we came up with the coordinates. Um, in general, we do use the innermost unique coordinates um, that are just inside of the flanking low copy repeat regions or segmental duplications for most of our recurrent CNVs. Um, if there is any, uh, if there is a need to adjust those coordinates, uh, we will generally have a comment in the um, in the actual review of the region on our uh, dosage map site. So um, something that's a little bit particular to the regions is that we typically will provide a description. Um, in addition to the, the phenotype information, we're going to provide a description of the, the region itself. So for complex regions like proximal 22Q, um, we want to make it very clear which region these types of re reviews correspond to. And then for, for regions that have variable breakpoints, um, the way that we're determining the coordinates for those kind of varies. Um, it's really based on a, a dive into the literature to determine whether a, um, a critical region has been delineated. And um, what we really want to do there is uh, provide broad coordinates uh, that sort of encompass what is the critical region um, that is required to confer um, expression of a particular disorder. So in general, you'll see that um, those regions are, are delineated, and even though there may be some critical genes within them, uh, we may have defined a relatively large region uh, overlapping them to ensure that when you use that track uh, for clinical review, that you don't miss the opportunity to identify um, a patient who may have a, a smaller or overlapping CNV that could result in some features of those syndromes. Um, and does that before answer? I move on, uh, before I move on to the next um, question, do you want to just say a word about the names of our region issues and how sometimes they include genes that that does not necessarily mean those are the causative genes? Yeah, that's an important point. So um, we do have a description of region naming that we'll be providing. A, um, we were just kind of talking offline earlier today about getting that uploaded. Um, some of our regions do have what we call landmark genes that are going to be annotated um, uh, along with the region itself. Um, and these are really going to be used to distinguish uh, adjacent regions from one another. Um, so there what we're choosing is um, typically we're going to go to the literature and try to choose region naming that has been most consistently utilized um, including the selection of those landmark genes if there is a gene within the region that is known to be dosage sensitive we will prioritize uh, that gene to be listed as a landmark gene 
if there aren't genes uh, within the region that are known to um, contribute to the features or if it's con considered to be a truly contiguous gene deletion or duplication disorder, uh, again, we'll typically choose uh, a gene that has been referred to um, in studies or um, we'll choose a gene that's kind of centrally located. All right, um, someone else is asking if you could just review again what people should do if they find additional information that could potentially change a dosage um, score. I think you had a slide on it or if you wanna go out to the live, there you go. Ooh. Let me just jump out here for a sec and get back there. Okay, so if you come across a, a gene or region review and you feel like in particular, this is the example that Erin showed last time, that our group needs to take another look at the evidence, either due to emerging studies that have come out since the original review, or if you, um, you feel that the evidence is in disagreement with the current scoring, you can click on this link here, which will be located on each gene or regions page and report information to us about a particular gene. Um, occasionally, users will submit along with their, um, with, with this input, they'll submit actual lists of, of papers that we need to take a look at, and that is uh, very helpful to us. If you've already encountered a gene or region during your routine clinical work and you feel like we need to go in and update it, um, that type of information is very useful uh, to share with us because then we can simply take that curation that's already been performed and use it to update the gene on our next um, monthly phone call. All right, and then the next question is about the FTP downloads. Do you want to show people um, you know, like where in UCSC you upload custom tracks or to talk about how you can import, I think it's the AED files into the um, in-house microarray software. Okay, let's see. So from our FTP page, um, as I mentioned, some of our, most of our files are gonna be formatted as bed files. So these should be loadable in most um, genome browsers and um, most software that's used for genomic um, uh, visualization. Uh, for the recurrent C and B track, we actually provide two different formats. One that I believe is specific to um, users of the Aptometrics platform, um, which is where these files were actually um, developed in labs that were using those. But we do have the more general bed files that's available. So you would click on these files and download them, and then you would navigate over to the UCSC Genome Browser, plug in your coordinates of interest um, if you want to get to this page. And then down at the bottom of this page, there is a, a button, and if I need to, I can show my uh, my actual uh, browser um, and do kind of a live demo here. Um, but there's a button right below um, uh, below this window that um, that is going to have a a way to upload files. Um, let me see. It's called Add Custom Tracks. If we have time, I can demonstrate that. Um, yeah, you know, we do have a few more questions, um, but if we can knock those out and there's a moment, we can um, move out to the live UCSC site and show where that upload custom tracks is. Absolutely. Um, so for, for now, I'll move on to the next question, and that is, are there any common annotations for CMVs that you would expect to see on a clinical report? 
um, such as similar DGV variants, overlapping genes, or even presence in ClinGen dosage maps. Can you repeat the question one more time, Erin? I just want to make sure. Yep, they're just asking, they're asking. Um, I think what's being asked is like, what, what are you expecting to see in the clinical report when you are describing your evidence? Like, should you be making note of similar DGV variants, overlapping genes, or, you know, whether your gene was in the dosage map? So, um, well, I can I can speak on behalf of the way that we do it here at ARUP. Um, so typically what we do for our clinical reports is, um, and you know, obviously our process is also evolving, and I think this is one of the items that came up on the first call is, uh, can we talk about how labs are actually utilizing these variants? And um, we've already talked offline and plan to have some uh, examples of, of real life implementation uh, in a future call as part of this webinar series. Um, but generally what we do is we will report the total number of genes in the interval and um, we've recently started also including the total number of protein coding genes. Um, Aaron, I believe you went over this on the, the first call, how to um, use the decipher search tool to determine the total number of protein coding genes. Um, I, I do think that that's um, an important feature to add to your reports, particularly if you have a larger CNV, um, because I think it more accurately um, communicates the potential dosage effect of a, of a region. So if you have a, you know, a one megabase uh, duplication that includes, you know, 30 genes. I don't think, I don't know if that's a, a real, a good real life example, um, but versus say five genes uh, that are protein coding, um, that, that's clearly going to communicate um, a potential difference in the um, interpretation. Um, and then in terms of um, the so that sort of uh, fits into a result description section. Maybe what I'll do is I'll go down to that example report at the end here um, that we provided. And I do think that, um, and we do plan on a, in a later call here to go through some examples. Um, but laboratories can, um, can include information um, uh, about the result summary itself. So what, what is uh, found here, if it does, if your CNV does overlap a known uh, pathogenic region or gene, uh, that I think is also important to highlight. Um, obviously, uh, one, one point that I think is, is very important is that if you have a large deletion um, that happens to include a, a gene that has been determined to cause a hereditary cancer risk, um, or a late onset condition, we do have those genes curated uh, in our dosage group, and those should be also important to highlight um, in your uh, list of genes. Um, in terms of the interpretation section, um, we typically will provide a summary of our uh, of the clinical findings associated with that variant. Um, if you have say, a, a variant that, um, that you're questioning whether it results in a similar clinical phenotype, I think that's important nuance to add, um, but also to list those clinical features so that clinicians can use them to correlate with their patient's findings. Um, and then um, another important feature would be um, the genetic counseling for the variant. So if it's expected to be inherited or de novo, um, if additional testing is warranted, those are all um, features that we um, typically include. Um, but in terms of citing individual variants from um, individual like reviews from, from the dosage group or um, individual variants from clinical and control databases, um, I don't think that that's a general um, requirement. Um, but it may be useful, particularly if you're um, dealing with a VUS or something that's more rare, um, to try to help point clinicians to um, other information that they may that may be helpful for clinical correlation. So hopefully, I've answered that one. 
I don't know, Erin, if you have anything else you would add. Um, no, but we did get a second question about the bed files and then which files can be uploaded to Affymetrics. So if you want to take the last six minutes to just show people um, that kind of stuff, I think that would be a good use of our last few minutes. Okay. Not to put you on the spot, hopefully you don't have weird stuff Just going on your sure. I'm Just making <laughs> sure I need to close any windows that I need to. Uh, okay. Okay, it looks like you stopped sharing screen and now you're starting again. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's take I'm gonna take some coordinates here. Um, let's see. Give me one sec. I'm going to navigate to one of our favorite regions, 22Q, <clears throat> and pick a variant in here. All right. So, from the UCSC Genome Browser. I'm pulling up coordinates in the background, but if you wanted to pull them from our public site, you could certainly do that. I'm checking by assembly and going to load up this region according to HG19. And I'm going to see if I have those tracks loaded here. So I've got a lot of uh, a lot of tracks loaded. So I've got to scroll down to the bottom here. Um, and then I'm going to go to Add Custom Tracks, choose a file. And here's where I have to be a little bit careful here. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. I've selected our recurrent list and I'm going to submit that. And then view it back in the genome browser. So once you load in a track, it is going to um, take you to the first location where that variant occurs. So I'm going to have to re enter this region. And in terms of uh, loading it into your software, um, I recommend if, to sort of refer to um, the software specific instructions for that. Um, most softwares are pretty straightforward. So um, I have chosen the typical uh, uh, variant that's observed in, in association with a DeGeorge syndrome. This is the A to D deletion uh, region, deletion and duplication region. And I'm just going to zoom out to show users that we do have all of the uh, segmental duplications annotated here along with the intervening region. So I find when I'm um, doing case review that if I happen to encounter um, particularly some of these more distal uh, events, which are a little bit more rare, um, that this file uh, provides me with an easy way to check and see which region I'm dealing with. Um, and then I will typically report uh, that specifically in the report and say that this is a, a distal type one uh, D to E 
deletion or duplication if this is the variant that I'm dealing with. Um, you can see that the track, um, the way that I have it displayed right now, it's just showing um, these sort of staggered um, here, but you can see all of the segmental duplication in black and then the unique sequence in orange. All right. Well, we are right at the hour. Oh, there's one okay. last question. When an updated bed file is available, will there be a clear notification that will show on the ClinGen section of dosage sensitivity? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that one. So um, as Erica mentioned at the top of the call, um, our files and our dosage site have been previously hosted by NCBI. And at this very moment, as we speak, we are in the process of moving it over to ClinGen. So in the past, no, there has not been any notifications that tracks have been updated um, when it was hosted by NCVI. But once we um, get our move taken care of and get everything settled on our end, that's something that we can consider for the future. All right. Oh, can I well, say one quick thing? Yeah, go ahead. Erin, um, just the answer to case V in case you guys were interested. Um, our patient actually had Kabuki syndrome, so <laughs> I was looking up, looking that up um, earlier. If you were interested to know, um, so that that is a, a sort of a truly secondary finding in terms of the diagnostic workup for that patient. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.